Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sheldon McCoy. I'm the Executive Director for the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, and I just want to say welcome to today's webinar. Uh, and also like to note, uh, also because of our partnership with the Government of Canada and their contribution, uh, this is uh, helps with our webinar series and everything else that we do here at the Foundation. Uh, for today's webinar, uh, we're very uh, fortunate to have uh, Dr. David Rott be present here with us to uh, do a presentation. Uh, just a few words on uh, Dr. Ott. He is a PhD candidate and research assistant uh, in Tommy Lennon Saris uh, at the Canadian Rivers Institute with the University of New Brunswick. Uh, he's originally from Switzerland uh, and he did his undergrad degree in engineering partially at ETH Zurich at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, where he specialized in river restoration. He then switched to a master's in applied limnology, focusing on fish ecology at the university, also in Vienna. After his master's, he worked for the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology and in fisheries management in the provincial government before moving to Fredericton in late 2017 for his PhD work. Uh, today, he's going to be speaking on smolt to adult supplementation, a potential conservation tool in depressed Atlantic salmon populations. Um, and at the end of the session, we will allow, like we always do, a good 15 minutes to uh, be able to do questions and answers. And I'll let you know how we're going to do that uh, at the end of the presentation. But for right now, I'd like to pass it on and give the floor to uh, Dr. Rott and just welcome. Thank you for being here today to do your, your presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlene. Um, Yes, I'm very excited to have the possibility to present some of my PhD work from the last years in this series. Um, I'm currently still a PhD candidate in Tommy Linansari's lab and continuing to work in his lab. Um, and as you can already see from the first slide, I will be talking to you about the small to adult supplementation strategy for Atlantic salmon. Um, I will give you a general overview on some of the most important findings from my work over the last years and mainly focus on the SAS females, but there are many more detailed findings from, findings from this work that did not make it in today's presentation. I mean, I assume that all listeners are well aware of the life cycle of wild Atlantic salmon, but I will just spend a couple of seconds talking everybody through it again. Um, the important part here is to remember that there is a freshwater and a seawater and so oceanic stage. Um, the cycle starts with the eggs being deposited in freshwater where they hatch and the juveniles spend a couple of years in the freshwater systems before migrating out to sea as smolts, traveling the Atlantic Ocean for at least a year to then return most of the time to their natal rivers as fully sexually matured adult salmon to then reproduce and the cycle is closed. These days it is fairly recognized that a high at sea mortality from small to returning adults uh, is occurring, which presents one of the main reasons for declining numbers of various Atlantic salmon populations across their distribution range. So what is the SAS strategy and what does it have to do with it? Um, in short, this strategy aims to bypass the previously mentioned at sea bottleneck. To do so, the first step in this strategy is to collect wild smolts during their migration to sea. So these are wild smolts that were born in the river, have gone on, undergone natural selections to this point and are then collected. Um, in a second step, these smolts are then transferred to a rearing facility where they, are kept, where they are kept until they have fully matured to adulthood. Once fully matured, the adult fish are released back into the river of origin to then reproduce naturally. So comparing the SAS strategy to other various forms of supplementation, for example, egg stocking, fry stocking, par or small stocking, the main anticipated advantages of this strategy 
are that fish have to compete for spawning access and for mates, resulting in naturally produced juveniles that undergo natural selection once again through all of their life stages. So the anticipated goal of SAS programs are that they have a positive effect in boosting the number of spawners in a population where the decline, decline is uh, of the population is linked to the low numbers of returning adults and therefore also increase the number of progeny found in those systems where the SAS fish are stocked. The SAS strategy set itself is far the new-ish in the Atlantic salmon world compared to previous supplementation strategy but it has been implemented for various specific salmon species over the years and in Atlantic Canada, Parks Canada, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans run such programs for Atlantic salmon. Um, here on the left, you can see Dr. Kurt Samways, who is the research chair of Parks Canada, posing with one of the fish from their programs before being released. He's also in my supervisor committee for my PhD. And for the work that DFO does, there are multiple reports and publications out there on the results from their um, gene banking program. Just shortly, my, C uh, my research with a SAS program was located in the Miramichi system. So the following work that, I, that you will see was mainly done at the Miramichi Salmon Conservation C uh, Center in Southeast and in the northwest mill stream, a tributary um, to the northwest uh, Miramichi that enters directly into the tidal section. Um, this was a newly set up SAS pro program and I was working with the first cohorts that were collected in this program. So some of my results are not necessarily comparable directly to programs from Parks Canada or from DFO who had their programs running for a much longer time. So, but of course, with such a novel strategy, there are knowledge gaps. Um, how well does it work? Are there risks? How do SAS fish compare to wild fish? And many more questions. And to answer some of those most pressing questions, my work was based on two main pillars, a laboratory experiment and an experimental river study. Um, the lab experiment was, as I mentioned, what took place in the Miramichi Salmon Conservation Center and the river setup took place in the Northwest Mill Stream. So during the lab part, the main focus was on eventual differences in morphology between mature SAS and wild fish, the fertilization success of the males and the survival rates of the eggs from fertilization to first feeding fry. And I just want to take a quick moment to introduce some terms that I will use now throughout the presentation to make sure people uh, understand what I am referring to. So just as an example, within the SAS project, if a, if a small gets collected in the spring of 2018 and is transferred into the hatchery. In 2019, a year later in the autumn, this small could return as a wild fish after one sea winter as a maiden spawner, also known as a grills, to, to spawn. In my presentation, these fish, the wild fish, would are referred to as one sea winter fish, like here the acronym 1SW. A SAS fish at this stage is referred to as a one hatchery winter fish, labeled as 1HW. In 2020, the wild fish would then be referred to as a two sea winter fish, and the SAS fish would be a two hatchery winter fish, so two SW and two HW. Already a spoiler here, one of the first results. Um, whereas wild fish can mature for the first time after one sea winter as a maiden spawner, we did not see this for the SAS one hatchery winter. No fish in the program matured after one winter in the hatchery. So there's already a first difference that we found um, between wild and SAS fish. So 
in the morphometric chapter, I will talk about fish that had fully matured and focus on simple parameters such as length, weight, egg diameter, and the fecundity slash the number of eggs per female. So we conducted this test over several years and on the left, in the left plot, you can see the overall results from the different groups. So one zebra into two zebra into two hatchery went to SAS fish, three hatchery went to SAS fish. And on the right, the results are split up between the years. X axis, as mentioned, are the different groups. Y axis here is the fork length. So overall, all groups differed significantly from each other, which you can see here, looking at these 95% um, confident intervals for the plots. Unsurprisingly, the wild one sea winter fish were the smallest fish out of the groups. And then we found that this two sea winter fish, all maiden spawners in this study, were the largest fish that we found. This the same age two hatchery winter SAS females, so they are the same age, CH, as these wild two sea winter fish, fell in between the, the wild, the two wild groups, the one sea winter and the two sea winter groups, and differ significantly from both of them. Um, in one year of the study, um, I also we also uh, integrated three hatchery winter fish into the study, so fish that matured for the first time after spending three years in the hatchery. And as you can see, that extra year in the hatchery um, led to the three hatchery, fin uh, three hatchery winter SAS fish being significantly larger than the one year younger two hatchery winter fish, but the extra year in the hatchery did not allow them to grow larger um, than the wild two sea winter fish. And these fish are one year younger than the three hatchery winter SAS fish. Um, oh, some animations I didn't click. Um, well, the next next I looked at was the weight, and there are some differences here now. While again we see that the wild one sea winter fish are again the lightest um, of all the groups, and that the two hatchery winter fish is significantly heavier than the one sea winter fish, but significantly lighter than the two sea, same age two sea winter fish, we can see that the three hatchery winter fish are significant, uh, do not differ significantly in weight from the two sea winter fish. Also, the effect, as uh, so the, the difference between length and weight, like the weight is less pronounced, as the difference in weight is less pronounced as we saw with the length and this leads to one of the typical findings with hatchery reared Atlantic salmon, that their condition factors are significantly higher than the ones you would find in wild fish. The next thing I looked at was the egg diameter um, from those females. Again, some things are similar, but there was also a surprise in here again. One, the wild one sea winter fish had the smallest egg diameters overall found in this study. The two hatchery winter fish from the SAS program, again, fall in between the two wild groups. So same age, two hatchery winter SAS females have a smaller egg diameter than the wild two sea winter fish. And if you look at the the length and the weight that we looked at before, it kind of makes sense. It's the same trend that you see. But at the same time, talking about that, it is a surprise that the three hatchery winter fish that we looked at during one year of the study that exhibit the largest egg diameter and they are significantly larger than all the other groups. And this is kind of surprising since like in wild fish, it has been well documented also in the Miramichi that egg diameter closely correlates with length of the female. And if you remember like the three hatchery winter fish um, had a reduced, significantly reduced length compared to the two sea winter fish, but had no difference in weight. So this finding came a little bit as a surprise. Um, looking at fecundity, um, these are the absolute 
number of eggs that we found in the different groups. Again, one sea winter fish, not surprising, having the lowest number of eggs. We can see um, three hatchery winter sass females had a lower mean than two sea winter fish, um, but they did not differ significantly. They did differ significantly from the one year old, the three hatchery winter fish, and three hatchery winter fish did not differ significantly from the wild two sea winter fish. If you would standardize these numbers into eggs per kilogram of fish, SAS, fi SAS females actually had significantly more eggs than wild females. So next we will be looking at the results from the fertilization success experiment. So here we're mainly focusing on the, the wild, uh, on the male component. And the experimental setup was very simple. Um, I took the eggs from multiple wild females. The eggs were split up and then fertilized by a SAS male and by a wild male. Um, I then collected all the eggs that die prior to hatching. They were stored in Stockard solution to then be examined if, su uh, if successful fertilization occurred. And results here really quick. Um, fertilization success was very high for both groups with a mean fertilization, fertilization success rate of 98.33 for the SAS males and 97.77 um, for the SAS males. So, and even though these results are statistically significant different from each other, so SAS, um, male SAS having a higher fertilization success rate than wild males. Um, this is a, for me is a classic example where I say statistically it is significant, but in real life there is no difference. Hence I state that the a difference in survival rate of SAS or wild females eggs is not linked to differences in fertilization success of SAS versus wild males. Which brings me to the next point, which is probably one of the most stress, um, the most interesting part from the lab study, the survival rates. Are there any differences in survival rates between eggs from SAS females and wild females? So for this, we had a common garden set up as for this study. Um, where we had SAS female, wild female, SAS males, wild males. We obtained all the possible cross groups um, from those individuals. But since we, since I stated that the males have no real influence on the mortality rate of the eggs, the analysis purely focused on the differences between SAS and wild female eggs. So I looked at the survival to hatch, survival throughout the Alvin stage, up to first feeding fry. And then of course the overall survival from, also the combined survival of the two from fertilized egg to first feeding fry. Um, so this study took place over two years in 2018 and 19. Again, the plot on the left side is the overall results. On the right side, uh, the results are split up between the years. And overall survival was significantly lower for the SAS eggs from, uh, from fertilized eggs to first feeding fry um, with a median survival rate of 38% for the SAS eggs and 70.5% for the wild eggs. Um, you can see this in both years, 2018, the survival of the SAS eggs was lower. In 2019, the survival of the SAS egg was low. SAS eggs was lower. There were differences between the two years, but the survival of the wild eggs was always higher. And you can see that in the second year of the study, like while we saw a reduction in survival for the wild fish, we saw an increase in survival in the second year. But overall, um, both here combines, it's a, we see a clear significant difference between survival, between the overall survival. In a little bit more detailed, egg survival from fertilization to hatch gives the same result. 
SAS fish had a significant lower survival rate to this through this stage with overall 44% survival compared to 80% survival for the wild eggs. Again, in both years, the survival was significantly higher for the, the wild eggs. But again, we can see here on the median, like the, as in the, in the overall survival for the wild eggs, we saw a reduction in the second year and for the SAS eggs, we saw an increase in survival in the second year of the study. The interesting part here from this study really in the lab setup is that for the Alvin stage, we see a slightly different result. So while as overall, the survival rate for the Alvin stage was, was much higher compared to the survival rate from fertilized egg up to hatch. And this difference is especially clear um, for the, in the SAS Alvin. So in, two, um, in 2019, the, the Alvin survival rate did even not differ from the survival rate seen for the wild Alvins in 2018 and 2019. In 2018, you can see from this confidence interval here um, that the variability within the survival rate of the SAS fish was much higher than in the second year throughout the Alvin stage. Again, these 2018 fish were one of the really early cohorts um, that are from the Mermersi Salmon Association collection. So it's a little, it's like with uh, what we saw for the morphometrics, there seems in the second year, there seems to be an improvement. Um, so the take home message here is that currently the Atlantic salmon smalls that are raised at the MSA hatchery differ in maturation rate or for in the morphology and regarding to their survival rate of the eggs but there was no difference in fertilization success of the SAS males compared to the wild males. And just to quickly put these numbers a little bit into perspective, the other program, the two other programs that are um, uh, currently ongoing in Atlantic Canada, um, there are some results from, um, from the Magdecrack Biodiversity Facility where some egg work was done, where eggs were uh, incubated in stream in Scotty boxes. And there was a uh, early study from in 2004, 2006 from Flanagan et al. Um, they were looking at survival rates um, of their fish in incubation baskets up to the eight stage. And their survival range ranged from 4% to 35%. A more recent study done in 2020 and 2022 from a colleague of mine, William Miller, Miller um, also used Scotty boxes and he had a survival rate of 323 to 58.2%. So the 44% survival rate that I saw up to hatch falls right in there as well. Um, these results found from Atlantic salmon used in the gene, used in the gene banking program from DFO. So now the question is, um, can we translate these results into a wild scenario? So if we release SAS fish into a river, will we see the same outcome when natural selection occurs. So this is where I had the experimental river set up where we released adult sass and wild fish into a blocked off natural stream during the spawning season. Um, we collected data on movement of the fish, on the habitat usage of the fish and various other parameters. And the year following the adult release, we conducted multiple surveys catching young of the year Atlantic salmon to look at their parentage to see how successful the different adult fish from the previous year release had been. So again, this work took place in the headwaters of the Northwest Mill Stream, the tributary that runs directly into the tidal section of the Northwest Miramichi. So the experiment was conducted over 
a total of four years. Um, I will start with 2018, where we released 20 pairs of SAS and 20 pairs um, of wild fish simultaneously in St. Patrick condition to see how do the two comp groups compare to each other in a natural setup. Um, the initial release in 2017 um, were I, we only released SAS, 20 pairs of SAS fish. And in 2020, we released two different aged cohorts of SAS fish. So 20 fish, as a 20 pairs that had matured after two hatchery winters. So after having spent two years in the hatchery and, and 20 pairs of SAS fish that had matured after three years in the hatchery. So three hatchery winter fish. And um, just a really short description on the setup that we were using in the in the mill stream. So we had so we had two barrier fences installed um, to hinder the released fish from leaving the experimental river prior to the end of spawning season, and we controlled for wild fish coming into the system. Um, the fish were released into a protected 150 meter long area first between the two barrier fences to then release them simultaneously into the experimental stretch upriver of the barriers. Um, in 2018 and 2019, when SAS and wild fish were re released simultaneously, the fish were also equipped with radio tags so we could find the fish each day to compare movements and habitat, habitat usage. So now uh, part of the results is uh, are things like this confusing plot here, where you, where I compared, um, where I looked into, or where I compared between origin of the fish, so SAS versus wild, sex, and successful and unsuccessful spawners, how their movement, also how the movement behavior was in the experimental river section. Other results that came out of this radio tracking studies was that we were able to um, record the habitat usage. So we were also comparing differences in habitat, habitat usage of SAS versus wild fish, male versus female, and successful versus unsuccessful spawners. Um, and as and as I mentioned before, um, I will show a few key results here from this tracking work, but there was much more that we found out. But some of the find, some of the important findings from this work was that between origins of SAS and wildfish and sex um, and the sex within the two groups. Um, we did find no distance in the maximum distance the fish migrated upriver in the experimental stream, and there was no difference in the total distance that the fish migrated. Independent of origin of, uh, so again, SAS versus wild, we could see that a higher number in observed direction changes led to a higher likelihood of the fish to spawn. So the fish that were exhibited a more explorative um, characteristics were more likely to spawn in both groups and between both sexes. Um, we could only also clearly demonstrate differences in habitat usage between sex and successful and unsuccessful spawners, but no differences in habitat usage between successful SAS and successful wild spawners. One of the very interesting findings that we saw is that there is an indication that there is a differences in timing when these habitats are used. And particularly, we saw that SAS fish accessed riffles, so spawning habitat earlier than wild fish, indicating that, mo that there is the likelihood that SAS fish have a difference in spawning timing. So how many of the fish did we find to have spawned? Um, if we look, so in the first year with SAS fish only, we found eight out of the 20 males 
and 12 out of the 20 SAS females to have contributed successfully to spawning. Um, successful spawning here is defined as we were able to find progeny of the specific individual the following year. Under sympatric conditions with wild fish present uh, and SAS fish present the following years, there is these, we found these results in 2018. Nine of the 20 SAS males and eight of the 20 wild males, two out of the 20 SAS females, and nine out of the 20 wild females spawned successfully. 2019, still under sympatric conditions, two males were found, SAS males were found to have contributed to spawning, 16 of the wild males, four of the SAS females, 13 of the wild females. In 2020, when we released a total of 40 pairs of SAS fish, again, there were two different age cohorts, um, 20 pairs of two hatchery winter fish and 20 pairs of three hatchery winter fish, we found that 13 SAS males had spawned successfully and 21 SAS females had spawned successfully. Um, I think and from the SAS males, seven were two hatchery winter fish, four were three hatchery winter fish, and from the SAS females, 10 were two hatchery winter fish, and 11 were three hatchery winter fish. Um, so comparing the spawning success of SAS females under um, sympatric conditions it's it became it's clear that um sas fe there were significantly less sas females that spawned successfully when there was competition between wild and sas fish if we combine if we look at the results of the sas females spawning under allopatric conditions, so no wild fish were present, and compare it to the outcome of the sympatric release, no differences were found in the number of females, no significant differences were found in the amount of females that successfully spawned. So the takeaway here is like, if SAS females do not encounter um, competition with wild females, there is no significant difference in the number of females that spawn successfully. Also again here, as we mentioned, um, I, we created an artificially high density of adult individuals in this experimental section. And if we would have this many females, uh, wild females left in the sections like this, there would not be a use for a supplementation strategy like the SAS program is. So, but what did we find um, regarding the progeny? So how many juveniles did we find the following years? So. If we look at the, the at one generation, we collected almost 3,000 juveniles over the course of this study. Um, a bit more than 2,500 of them, we were able to assign them to a known adult from the previous release. And additionally, we also um, tagged almost um, 1,800 of those fish with a pit tag. So this table shows the overall, num overall number of juveniles found for the different groups. And while it is not very detailed, um, it shows a very clear result. SAS, fem SAS females, as so we found that SAS females had contributed, significant, have, had, uh, contributed significantly less juveniles than wild females. This becomes particularly apparent during the years of sympatric releases, so 2018 and 2019, where you can see with wild females, we found 775 juveniles in one year and over 800 um, in 2019, compared to only 
four juveniles from the two SAS females that spawned successfully and 12 juveniles from the four SAS females that spawned successfully in 2019. The numbers are a little, again, the numbers are a little bit, are better um, if we look at SAS females that spawned under allopatric conditions, so without the wild females' presence. So in 2017, we found, we found 114 individuals, and in 2020, where we had um, double the numbers of SAS females in the system, we found 227, but still significantly less than we found for the wild females, but significantly more than for the SAS females under sympatric um, conditions. Um, so, um, the overall conclu conclusion from the results, from this quick overview of results, is that there is room for improvement for SAS fish um, from the Miramichi SAS collection. Um, more work is particularly needed to get SAS females and their eggs to a level that would produce a higher number of prog progeny. So some of the work that I am currently continuing is listed here to kind of look a little bit into this matter. So we are current we are on we are doing ongoing studies on changes in phenotypical appearance linked to improved husbandry. So the Miramichi Salmon Association has taken measures, has made changes to their rearing environment over the years. Um, this year we have another survival study to see if any of these, as in a laboratory, in a lab setup again, to see if any of these changes lead to an increased survival rate. Um, over the last few, few years we also have collected eggs from different SAS programs and from different wild Atlantic salmon populations to compare the egg content because there, eventually there are differences in the content of a SAS egg that leads to the reduced survival rates that we see. Um, and an ongo a study that we started, that I started in the fall um, last year, is that we tagged post-spawned um, SAS fish, so SAS kelts, as we equip them with acoustic tags, to monitor their survival rate throughout the winter to look at their um, at their migration behavior in the spring and particularly to look at their their survival rates after experiencing the oceanic stage and if possible to get hands on these fish after they experience the oceanic environment to then see if a SAS fish that we've now seen has reproduced, has spawned as a maiden spawner and compared to a wild fish wasn't by far not as successful in doing it and contributing juveniles. If a SAS fish experiences then a full oceanic cycle and would come back, if these numbers would improve. The could one of the hypotheses that I have there is that due to the fact that um, SAS fish have a very high um, um, fitness factor, um, they might have a higher survival rate and therefore as compared to wild fish and therefore might have a higher chance to reproduce a second time and eventually more successful than at the first attempt. Um, I also want to mention uh, other work that has been done um, within this program, um, especially the one from Kyle Wellband, who um, published his work on DNA methylation between um, one generation SAS juveniles and wild juveniles, um, as well as two honor theses that were um, that are a result of the work that. Our lab did with the SAS fish, one from Reed Sutherland, who specifically looked into differences of two hatchery winter versus three hatchery winter females. And Abigail Culberson, who worked with our the pit tagged individuals that we had in the Northwest Millstream and the effect that pit tagging had on them. 
So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and that it was halfway understandable. Um, there are many more details to in this strategy that were found, but that, as I said, did not make it in today's presentation. But these results can either be heard during my PhD defense that might happen this year and in the resulting publications from this work. Um, I also wanted to thank the various people from within and outside of our lab that helped with the immense work that was involved over the years and all the founders that helped along the way. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for any questions. Thanks, David. That was a great uh, presentation. And uh, so we will open up to question and answers, which is always great to have that opportunity. Um, so we can do it by two ways. So you can always type it in and I can read it out loud for uh, David to answer, or you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask the question uh, by yourself. So I see there's already something written up. So I'll go to that first. Um, it says, great work, David, an interesting project. Uh, with the combined observations of delayed maturation, maturation and decreased length and reduced egg to fry survival of hatchery fish versus wild fish, are there genetic fitness concern with SAS fish? And if so, has analysis for this been performed? Um, I mean, a very good question. and. Um... No analysis has been performed, and in that regard, I can really refer to most um, I can the work that Kyle Wellband did, the publication. Um, I personally, as the things that we are looking into, I think there is much room for improvement there in the husbandry environments, particularly in things like feed densities and enriched. Um, and an enriched environment within the within these tanks that the fish are raised in. So um, at the end, so in the summer, I would be able to give a better answer because we are actually looking in into it right now to see if such changes make a differences a difference in the survival. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, where were the fish raised on shore or at sea in open pens? So the fish that I was working with, they were raised in um, RAS systems, so in land-based systems that were fed with well water. Um, there are there are other um, programs that raise them in seawater in open net pens, but our the fish that were part of this study were all raised. Um, in land-based tanks with fresh water. Okay. Um, I just sent an unmute request to uh, Craig Purchase. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. All right. I think that works. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All yes. right. So the um, so somewhat related to that last question. So I would think so. It would, not surprisingly. Uh, I would have predicted the egg quality was probably poorer on these captive fish. Yep. And some of that might, so the mechanism wouldn't be obvious, come from the basically being in freshwater or saltwater per se. But a lot of it could be predicted based on diet, maybe. So I, unless I missed it, I don't, you know, it's well known under an aquaculture environment that, for example, food that is kept to grow uh, fish to market really produces fish that have poor gametes. And so sometimes there's special diets fed to fish that are being used as breeders and everything. But even being said, I mean, I mean, I would think the most parsimonious explanation of if there is a real explanation for the results you got, they're probably related to what the fish are eating. So in terms of trying, you know, for, I mean, I get, I, I guess the whole point of this is of all the effort and the money that goes into keep keeping these fish for doing these supplementations, you want them to then perform as best as possible. And, uh, you know, I'm just curious of what you fed them and is there, you know, work in, the, you know, to 
compare diets or to feed them something else and try to get them to do better? Yeah, um, I really, I do agree with basically everything you said there. Um, so what I can tell you, I, I couldn't tell you the exact um, composition of the feed that uh, the fish obtained, but it was, it was specific, it was designed for, um, so it differed from feed that was be used usually in aquaculture, but um, the fish that are currently at the Miramichi Salmon Conservation Center, the smolts that are being raised, there were there were uh, changes made to the to the feed. So that is one of the things one of the things that have changed, and this is one of the reasons that we are looking at again at the survival rates if anything changed. Um, exactly. Also, you. Um, that's why we also do this egg content analysis that we start where we collected eggs from all kinds of different sources from the different as programs in the maritimes and from different wild populations where exactly once you okay what is in this egg and if we compare it to a wild fish is there something that the sas fish is lacking that the the wild egg has and that could be counteracted by eventually by feed um, since like I'm collaborating in this work, but since I have more of an engineering background and then switched over to science, if someone like we will run these eggs, as it, this, this work will be done this year, I will not be the person who then will find out what a difference in certain fatty acids, for example, will mean for the egg per se. But um, it's a very good question and it's exactly things that we are trying that are currently being tackled and monitored if any of these changes lead to what the goal of this strategy would be, having a number of juveniles, as of having these fish producing numbers of juveniles that would justify the quite intense efforts that has to be put into this strategy. Okay. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, uh, David. We're going to move to uh, Tommy uh, Linensari. I'm going to unmute you and you should be able to uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Sure. Thank you. Um, and I don't actually have a question. Unfortunately, I do have my uh, class that I teach at this exact time. So I only heard uh, two minutes of David's talk, so I really don't know what's being discussed and what David showed. I'm sure he did uh, a good job on this, but I I do work with David on this issue, so I had a couple of uh, comments to the previous questions. Um, and David, you you correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here. Uh, yep. There was a question about the uh, the genetics, um, and and while that hasn't been a thorough examination. There, there is a little bit of data we do have there, um, because the fish that <clears throat> um, that did go to the experimental stream, it is a genetic tool that we use for looking at the parentage. That SNP chip, single nu nucleotide uh, chip that we developed, it, it only has 500 SNPs, but those were selected from the 50,000. Uh, SNPs that we initially looked at and were selected to be the most variable ones for this specific population. And in that data, if we compare the juveniles from um, the SAS fish in the mill stream to uh, the background population across Miramichi, there is no genetic difference that we can detect. So there is a little bit of information on that and anything in an, our um, Disposal at this time does not point to there being genetic uh, selection, such as domestication selection, going on in that juvenile generation. Again, it's not specifically designed to look at that question, but the evidence that we do have over those 500 SNPs does not support uh, a genetic uh, differentiation there. So that was the first point, David, if I misinterpreted that, 
Um, I, yeah, I, I think, think I had it correct. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was from the, the lab that was part of the lab experiment where Kyle was looking into where these results came from, where the juveniles were raised at the hatchery and not the ones from the mill stream. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the epigenetic epigenetics is a is a different beast than in addition. And Kyle's paper will go into that in detail that David showed there in the end. Um Greg's um deliberation about the diet. In, in indeed um it wasn't that we weren't fully thinking diet uh when david launched these uh studies in the first place but i guess what we had at the time in our hands was too many questions to be looking at at the same time so we did make the decision since cook aquaculture was uh, a major partner in the research um we made the decision that through Cook's expertise into salmon aquaculture and raising salmon, we were thinking that, well, while diet is, as Craig, you, you're nail on, uh, the provisioning and, and, and nutrient, nutrients drive many factors. We, we were kind of uh, banking on the fact that, well, there are other aspects that we need to look into first, given that, um, we basically assume that by the long experience in the cook aquaculture raising salmon, the diet, what, whatever is being provided, um, would be good. Now we're, as, as David explained, we're kind of backtracking a little bit and, and now making sure that uh, the nutrient or whether or not there may be something missing by comparing wild populations to these fish in the gametes well in the in the eggs to identify may there be something that is missing that comes from the from the nutrition uh point of view because if so that is an easier one to fix because it's just like well let's add iodine more iodine there is a sort of a little bit of an iodine hypothesis here uh that we are contemplating because um the previous Mactaquac hatchery person had some earlier experiences with iodine potentially having something to do with it. So those are now addressed. Uh, great comment, Greg. And and again, um, because David or, or or myself are not nutritional experiment uh, experts, uh, Stephanie Colombo from the Dalhousie University and Joki Adesola from DFO, who both are salmon nutritionists, are uh, collaborating us on this. That was just my comments. Thanks. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, I'm going to move on to a couple of written uh, questions. Um, the first one is, is there indications that SAS adult preferred SAS mates uh, wild adults preferred wild mates based on your genetic analysis. Yes, um, we have very clear results there. Um, there are four, um, for the females, so when we look at the male contribution, there was during the St. Patrick release, there was um, no significant preference that the wild females had um, for between SAS and wild males. Um, the same for the SAS females. The difference that was found in the sympatric release was that the wild females had a higher number of spawning partners, partners than the SAS females had. So SAS females had less spawning partners. But there was no preference um, from the regarding origins of SAS or wild. Okay. Um, next question is asking if there's any correlation between egg size and uh, alevin survival rates, which may explain why SAS uh, alevin survived as well as wild uh, alevins despite lower survival from egg to alevin. Um, no, there was no correlation there. So it was, um, um, 
I mean, it was a surprise in the form that we saw these big differences in survival um, up to hatch and afterwards um, overall there, there were the lower survivals, but um, there was no correlation to the egg size. I can't tell if you all can hear me or not. Now we can hear you. There we go. Uh, this is Jeff Reardon from um, from down in the beach country in the U.S. Um, yep. Question whether the lower survival of the SAS um, project may be related to later spawning by the wild fish and red disturbance and egg displacement. Yeah, they're very good point again. Yeah, that's, these are exact things that we were not able to preserve, observe in this study, where it would be um, it would be beneficial to repeat these kind of studies with a different focus and exactly spending spending time on the spawning sites, really confirming that there is the actual differences in egg deposition between the sass and the wild females, and if exactly what you mentioned, if it occurs. Um, if wild females were basically like covering the SAS female reds. Um, there's also been work like this has been done with some of the Pacific salmon. Um, and there are some experiments that could be literally could be copied over. There's also looking at how specifically looking how a SAS female red looks like, um, how the eggs are deposited within that red um yeah there's there's many um more points that additional field experiments like this would um share more light into it yeah. okay perfect um thanks david uh we have a question uh, by lauren murdoch i will uh you can go right ahead Lauren? Oh, Charlene. Yeah. <laughs> this is um this is actually Marika Chaplin. Oh, I work yeah. with Lauren. She okay. very kindly so shared her me. link. Okay. Oh, she very kindly shared her link with me. <laughs> so <laughs> I think Hi, Marika. <laughs> I'm not trying to impose too much. Um, <laughs> um so thank you very much, David, for your presentation. I'm interested also in the, the survival and particularly interested in how your, how your work might replicate on the Willistook River. Um, and, you know, I guess lessons learned. And, and, and another question would be like, how long do eggs last? You know, if, if, the, if the discussion is around quality eggs and um, ensuring that, you know, you're starting with something that's going to be successful for future generations of salmon. Um, yeah, I guess I was curious about those kinds of things, if you feel comfortable talking about them. Um, yeah, as for the Wollstock River, I can only, the programs that are running there, I can only ref um, refer to um, the reports that they have. Um, um, published and um, I mentioned it, um, it, it was in the presentation that master thesis work from William Millar is um, the latest work that could be compared regarding egg survival to what I have done. Um, it was a different setup, um, so the eggs were spawned at the Mapticoc Biodiversity Facility and he then um, use Scotty incubation boxes and I think he implanted them in the Tobik River, so in the headwaters of the, the Wollastock River. And he also, um, 
think of it, he had 30 something like 33 to 58 percent survival rates up to the eight stage which is not completely up to hatch where i looked at but it kind of puts it a little bit from what i see into the same realm that those um those eggs also have a reduced um, survival rate compared to what I've seen for the Miramichi wild fish. Um, of course, he had also he had a very different. It's not really comparing apples to apples. He had a he had a different setup. Um, I would need to ask again a little bit what you mean by like how long the eggs would last. Um, I didn't really understand what you meant with that question specifically. Well, yeah, and maybe I don't know enough about it, but certainly in female humans, you can you can save eggs for quite a period of time. Oh, yeah. When yeah. you're helping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I'm like, yeah. How, how comfortable is that? Yeah, yeah. I have I have to say, like, yeah, interesting thought. I never thought. I have no idea, honestly, like, um, if. Uh, if you could freeze salmon eggs under some conditions, maybe someone in the audience would know. Uh, I actually interesting thought, but I, I have never thought about it, and uh, uh, I wouldn't know. Okay, so it might be a new new study. Um, yeah. I do have a question that Mike Rushton uh, typed in, but I see that he left. Uh, you must have had to leave, but I'll ask it anyways, uh, because this session is recorded, so uh, some others might like to hear the answer. Uh, his question was, do you think the insured feeding via hatchery resulted in helping equalize the weights in comparison to the wild fish who may have struggled more for food, even though they displayed smaller sizes compared to wild fish? In other words, if they were in the wild, would they also display lower weights potentially? Um, I was like, if these particular fish would have been exposed to the fully natural oceanic um, life circle, I don't think there would have been any differences in size. Um, we already, what I can say, we already see now with the with the newer cohorts that were. Um, collected, we already see diff like this changing these uh, the phenotypical appearance, like the basically the later cohorts, the newer cohorts that are collected, the better, the closer the fish get to wild fish, and the better the fish look. Um, it also has to be said that this was really the first generation of fish that was you that I worked with and the infrastructure that was put in place um, at the hatchery, um, there, there, were, there were some issues and there were, high, there were higher densities than planned for, which, which, were, which has an influence on growth. And one big part was that um, overall the project, because there were many more fish that were collected in this program that then I worked with, that were not allowed to be released. So while this, these fish that were planned to leave the hatchery and be stocked back into the Miramichi River had to be kept at the Miramichi Sam Conservation Center. So at some point they, were, um, they, as they had to stack the fish in there because the other cohorts were still growing and had to be transferred into those bigger tanks. So and these are things that I talk about in more detail in the in the thesis themselves. But the densities in the tanks of some of of these fish was much higher than it was originally planned, and that might have led to an even more drastic difference there in growth than um, than it could have been if the densities would have been as planned. But we still, even now with the lower densities, we still see a difference there. But if those fish would have gone out to sea, um, I wouldn't doubt that there is a that there would be no difference in size. Okay, thank you, uh, Craig. I see that you have unmuted. Do you have, do you have something to add? Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to unmute. The uh, I just made the comment about freezing the eggs. That uh, you can't freeze egg. Well, you can, of course, freeze them, but they won't survive after. 
Um, you can cryopreserve sperm, and people do, but you can't freeze eggs and use them. All right, thank you. Um, Thanks, Greg. We have a couple more written questions here, so I'll uh, I'll take the time to uh, to read them. Um, the next one is thanks for this presentation. Uh, given Tommy's comments that there was no noting genetic differences, should we be concerned implementing SAS in populations with limited biodiversity? Biodiversity in the sense of general biodiversity, or um, is it for the salmon population, uh, uh, reduced salmon population that only that there only has a few hundred, example, a few hundred fish left? I unmute Gary Spencer, who asked a question. So if you can clarify your question, uh, you are unmuted. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So my question is poorly written. I'll try and do it better verbally. When you have limited, like love this place for implementation of SAS is when your populations are very depressed. Yeah. When your populations are very depressed, you have limited genetic diversity in the population. Is there a concern about implementing SAS in a depressed population system? Yeah, as if that occurs, and that is literally what happened, what has happened in the inner bay of Fundy and where the programs that are in place, you have to um, be careful there, yes. Um, that being said, like, I mean, the strategy was not implemented in the Miramichi, and the Miramichi is far away from being in the state than at the inner bay of Fundy rivers. Um, there it is. A, that is a discussion for management to have at what point you would want to potentially implement a strategy like this. And exactly for these mentioned um, concerns, as the, the concerns that you mentioned, it's the less fish you have, the more you have a risk there, for sure. Thank you. Thanks, Gary, for clarifying the, the question. Um, Tommy said he's got a few points to clarify that uh, you want to be unmuted, Tommy. <laughs> Just a sec here. If I can. Yes, go right ahead. Uh, maybe I um, choose my words wrongly in my previous comment. Um, so. Uh, in David's research so far, we have we have no evidence of there being less biodiversity in that genetic component. If we lay the genetics out of those 500 SNPs that we have from Millstream over the background uh, genetic material, it both graphs look like a shotgun. Uh, if you shoot a shotgun on the wall. Um, there is no indication whatsoever um, in David's data that uh, it would somehow be narrower sample in terms of diversity. So, so maybe I was uh, insinuating something that um, was incorrect. Um, it's it's not today's topic, and I I, I understand that Kurt Samway's uh, has presented really recently, and it's it's not my data, but again, the Upper Salmon um, River experiment in, in parks, um, I believe in, in those really stressed salmon populations, what their evidence is suggesting is that the biodiversity now is actually increasing because there are actually more salmon, more genetic base um, spawning. So if, if anything, in these really depressed population, which where Miramichi is currently not yet at, um, but certainly Bay of Fundy, inner Bay of Fundy rivers are, uh, the evidence suggests the opposite in terms of biodiversity, in terms of, in, in terms of the genetic base actually increasing. So um, 
again, I, I don't want to talk more about that because it's uh, it's not my research. I'm sure but, Kurt can talk about it. You actually, as just adding to Tommy, it's also remind me that they are again out west where um, more work with um, similar strategy programs have been done they also have shown this increase in genetic diversity um, after implementing um, a SAS program so similar things uh, similar results what Tommy referred to to Kurt Samway's work We'll do um, one last question, uh, which I do have one here written um, before uh, closing the session today. And the last question is going to be, um, are there any theories as to why the maturity rates differ between SAS and wild Celts? Um, also, I mean, Celts would be post spawn fish, but um, maturation rate um, maturation rate in the hatchery it's um it might it might again be also linked to uh, to the feeding story um that we talked about before um and it, it is a very good question because like you in a strategy like this you you would aim for having the the small spending as little time as possible in captivity and releasing so it would be beneficial if you would have um, fish that mature after the first year in captivity um, I don't have a clear answer to it why that is but I, um, I know from the other programs that um, currently it's no program has um, achieved having maturation after one year also the programs that have been running for longer Thanks, David. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of questions here today. Uh, if something happens, uh, there's additional questions or you think of something uh, later on, uh, please let us know. Uh, just uh, email us and uh, we'll try our best to uh, to get an answer to you. Uh, for those that you know might be of interest, uh, wanted to see this and weren't able to today, uh, we are recording the session. So it will be available at the end of today on our YouTube page, just like all the, the other ones that we've had in the past. Uh, so uh, spread the word and uh, you can always go back and look at other presentations. Um, also, I just always like to note uh, that we do have another one coming up. Uh, we do have one February 8. Uh, it's uh, Thomas Buffin Bélanger uh, from Quebec, and uh, it will be a French presentation. It's going to be on hydromorphological sensitivity of salmon rivers in the Gaspé and Lower St. Lawrence. So I encourage you to join us on that day and to listen to that presentation. And uh, to Dr. Rott, we just thank you for taking the time for presenting today. And thank you for all of those that participated to come listen and, and ask some great questions. And I wish you all a great day. Thank you.